In this talk, I'm going to focus on the exhibition by Usha Seagram called Venus at Home. This was the topic of my own chapter in Iconic Works of Art by Feminists and Gender Activists, Mistress Pieces. Seagram kindly met with me on the 9th of November and I've incorporated her own comments into the talk. Venus at Home opened in June of 2012 at the National Arts Festival in Makanda. The show was initially conceptualised as travelling to many museums around the country immediately after its inauguration at the festival. Unfortunately, the funding raised was considerably lower than expected, and this meant that a less ambitious schedule was devised. Shown at the Johannesburg Art Gallery in 2013, it was hosted by the University of the Northwest in Potchefstroom in 2014 and made its final appearance at the Durban Art Gallery in 2015. While ultimately shown at less venues than initially envisaged, Venus at Home is nonetheless an iconic show. Although deploying a theme that has been widespread in feminist art practice, Sejuram's interpretation is pertinent to South Africa specifically. It recognises the ways in which South African women's experiences of domestic work have been configured through the impact of colonial and apartheid histories. Also, the works make ironical reference to those of celebrated white male modernists from the West. Through these allusions, Venus at Home referred to and questioned the ways in which gendered understandings that creative work stemming from the realms of the domestic and associated with women is necessarily of a lower order than that associated with the public domain and with men. But at the same time, it suggested how constructs about race and geography inform whether or not creative work is valued. Middle-class women in South Africa have almost invariably enjoyed assistance with domestic work. Embroiled in a politics of not only class, but also race, the practice of hiring domestic help during the apartheid years meant that almost without exception, the employer was white and the employed woman was black. Indeed, domestic servitude in white homes was the almost exclusive circumstance for black women to be allowed into so-called white areas. The post-apartheid years have not seen the disappearance of hired domestic labour by black women in white homes being a norm, but rather the extension of hiring practices to include black middle-class employers. Given these circumstances, it's unsurprising that prior feminist works in South Africa focused on the figure of the domestic worker and her position within the South African home. For example, well-known feminist artist Penny Siopas included a photocopy of a negative of a photograph from her youth, that showing her younger brother on the lap of his nanny in her Tula Tula, one of her works from the early 1990s. It was a work where Siopas explored the construct of maternity and subjectivity in this relationship where the hired help, the nanny, could only take on this role by leaving her own children in the care of others. There have been post-apartheid examples also. The most well-known example of these is Mary Sabunda Sophie, a figure or character introduced at the artist's first solo exhibition in 2009, and who would subsequently undergo various iterations. Inspired by the artist's grandmother, a domestic worker, Sophie is made from a fiberglass cast of the artist's own body and clothed in a garment that synthesizes the fabric of a South African domestic worker's uniform with a design that draws on an elegant Victorian gown. Exaggerating the sweep of bustles and the overall dimensions of costume, Sophie's exaggerated dress nevertheless keeps reference to domestic overalls, speaks of a fantasy to escape constraints of a life of drudgery and instead enter a world of opportunity and privilege. While Venus at Home differs from these prior incarnations in that it does not foreground the figure of the domestic worker, it does in some ways involve fantasy as well as an engagement with class and race. 
In commencing with the making of works for Venus at Home, Ceterum explains how it developed initially from a prior interest in the mundane. In May, up until that point, from student days, I had been making work about uh, routine and daily kind of mundaneness. I'm fascinated by the mundaneness of daily life. And uh, so I made work where I documented my daily journey between Johannesburg and Venetia, where I lived at the time, for example. Uh, I remember making an early work where I brushed my teeth continuously as um, an activity that one does every day when you wake up. And um, at that point, I think my, I had uh, two kids and my life was quite domesticated. It's only in retrospect that I made, made this connection between having kids and family and the predomination of the domestic. But uh, I decided to make work using used domestic objects. So I put out a call to family and friends and neighbors for domestic items. I had a list, brooms, irons, uh, I think ironing boards, mops. And it was quite amazing how people were very excited to give me their <laughs> disused, semi-functional, broken items. And then I had this collection of stuff. And then I just started playing with it, forming different kind of configurations, thinking about what I wanted to say conceptually, and that's how the body of work developed. Sejuan's approach was intuitive and playful, and one where experimentation was foregrounded. Her approach, in fact, tallied with what the New York designer Paula Scher describes as serious play. As Scher explained in a tip, Talk. Serious play is distinguished from solemn endeavors. Solemn design is often important in very effective design. Solemn design is also socially correct and, and is accepted by appropriate audiences. It's what right thinking designers and clients are striving for. Serious design, serious play is something else. For one thing, it often happens spontaneously intuitively, accidentally, or incidentally. It can be achieved out of innocence or arrogance or out of selfishness, sometimes out of carelessness. But mostly, it's achieved through all those kind of crazy parts of human behavior that don't really make any sense. Serious design is imperfect. It's filled with the kind of craft flaws that come from something being the first of its kind. Serious design is also often quite unsuccessful from a solemn point of view. That's because the art of serious play is about invention, change, rebellion, not perfection. Perfection happens during solemn play. The extensive number of household items that Sejurum received may have had something to do with the initiative being an excellent way for people to get rid of broken items. But, Sejurum indicates, people are also clearly motivated by excitement to be part of the project. In the Johannesburg Art Gallery incarnation of the show, she indicates, people were keen to find the objects they donated. And then it showed at the Johannesburg Art Gallery. And when it showed, because my kind of immediate network is Joburg based, uh, all the, I invited all the people who had donated these objects to come to the exhibition in Johannesburg. And what you need to understand is most of these people are not regular art gallery, museum going people. They are my mother's friends, <laughs> uh, my auntie's neighbors, and uh, you know, uh, even my art friends, it was their parents and those kind of people. So they all came and they came because they had some kind of value invested in through the donation of their objects. And when, when all of these people came, it was so wonderful because they were searching for their specific object. And they were identifying, oh, that's my iron, that's my mob. That, and <laughs> it was just wonderful to have that kind of connection. Yeah. Uh, specifically with contemporary art that's quite conceptual, uh, where there is a historic barrier through, through our education system, through our cultures of not being able to access contemporary art. So this was a wonderful kind of access point, which I just marveled, like it was wonderful to witness that. In addition to being constituted from used items, the anthropomorphism of items, the sense that these worn 
and torn objects were somehow also suggestive of worn and torn bodies was important to the meaning of works. Nowhere was this clearer than in the six installations of mops constituting hairstyles. Named after the styles deployed to wax or shave pubic hair, the works almost invariably generated amusement and delight. But this was perhaps less to do with the sauciness of creating an analogy between mops and pubic hair than the outcome of an incongruity between an impetus towards fastidiousness and sexual enticement signified by such grooming and connotations of weathered decrepitude conveyed by these well-used items. Bodily objection is a long history of deployment in feminist art practice, including in South Africa, as an act of resistance. A key influence in this regard was Mary Douglas's Purity and Danger, first published in 1966. In her exploration of the body within ritual systems, Douglas indicates that, and I quote, all margins are dangerous, unquote, pointing to matter issuing from the margins of the body, such as skin, nail clippings, feces, and sweat, and indicating that such defiance of boundaries was intricately linked to challenges to social structures. As is well known, this idea was developed by Julia Kristeva in her Powers of Horror, an essay on objection, first published in French in 1980 and translated into English in 1982. Arguing that marginal matter is disturbing not because it's dirty, but because it poses a threat to social structures, Kristeva defined objection as that which, and I quote, disturbs identity system order what does not respect borders, positions, rules, the in-between, the ambiguous, the composite, unquote. Douglas's and Christava's ideas have had a bearing on Linda Need's interpretation of the female nude. Speaking about an impetus in art from the West to necessarily control and contain the female body, Need suggests the following, and I quote, The forms, conventions, and poses of art have worked metaphorically to shore up the female body, to seal orifices, and to prevent marginal matter from transgressing the boundary, dividing the inside of the body and the outside, the self from the space of the other, unquote. In a context where women's bodies tend to be seen as the wayward and undisciplined product of nature, Need argues, such disciplining has in a sense been conceptualised as a process of submitting them to management by forces of male culture. Seizure's maps offer defiance against such stress on containment and management of the female form. In being weathered and used, rather than pristine and new, the mops speak not only of bodies that are themselves permeable and susceptible to ageing, but also of unboundedness and the refusal of categorization in a general sense. They're in fact ironical objects, while mops are associated with endeavours to keep the home free of detritus and germs. The particular examples, Seedrum is included, are arranged in such a way that they are suggestive of bodies susceptible to the effects of dirt, disease and decay. This association of these objects with women worn down through domestic drudgery is in fact reinforced if one has knowledge of the demographic who had used them. And there's a, a squeeze mop that has a long kind of sponge and a handle that you squeeze. And in fact, that mop, it doesn't look like a mop, it looks more like a broom, I suppose, with a handle. That object, that, uh, that mop, can't be, you can't use a normal round bucket for it either. It's got a special square bucket that one uses. So I, I started separating these and then uh, I, at some point I just realized that all the people that had donated these ones were white middle class. Um, and and uh, one of the people who donated it made a comment to say that her domestic worker doesn't like this one. She prefers a, what, what is called a spaghetti mop. But so the, the underlying kind of concept came up around class, around race, around who does the domestic work in the house, uh, and, and that there is a, a class and racial underpinning to, 
to the use of mops. <laughs> While the series of mops refers to people, Carl's hit was the outcome of a juxtaposed iron and a clothes hanger creating a bovine illusion. This reference is resonant on a number of levels. While perhaps referring to the sacredness of cars in Hindu culture, given Sijaram's own cultural background, cattle also have connotations to do with domesticity and the home and ones that are highly gendered amongst Nguni people in South Africa. Along with providing milk and meat as well as being sacrificed in sacred practices, cattle have historically been central to the payment of bride price, known as the bole in South Africa. That is, payment for wives who would bear children and look after the homestead. Besides being used to purchase wives, cattle ownership and management was historically the exclusive province of men. Such issues are highlighted but also undermined through the rendition of a car in C. Jerome's work. Normally associated with masculine ownership, the car is instead represented by items associated with a female domestic domain. The work also appears to comment on masculinist identities, albeit lightly and with humour, seeming on one level like a bizarre hunting trophy. That reference, coupled with the allusion to bride price in the choice of a car's head, may perhaps be interpreted as a critical comment on women being constructed as so-called trophy wives. Importantly, car's head is a parody. Cedron's juxtaposition of an iron and a hanger refers unmistakably to Picasso's well-known bull's head, which was constituted from the seat and handlebars of a bicycle. Sijirum explains how this parody came about. So these objects were lying around and I read something subsequent to this which uh, the synchronicity is quite uncanny uh, and there were some uh, hangers and there were some irons and in that pile I saw the hanger like this and the iron and I thought uh, it looks a bit like a like horns and an animal and I put them together and then I immediately thought of Picasso's bull's head, where he put a handlebar and a bicycle seat together. And later I read how that came about, and it was a very similar kind of experience where he kind of made a visual connection between two objects and saw something else. In a well-known discussion of parody, Linda Hutchin makes the important point that it's a genre that involves, and I quote, repetition with critical distance which marks difference rather than similarity, unquote. In other words, points of likeness between a representation and its source do not highlight their commonalities, but rather draw attention to their differences. And this is clear here. While assuming the general form of Picasso's bull's head, Sigurum's car's head is constituted from objects associated with the dreary act of labour, ironing, that takes place within the home, whereas a bicycle is associated with movement in the public domain and in some situations with recreation. Most crucially, the maker of Carl's head is a black female and a young mother living in Africa, rather than a renowned, mature, white male from Europe, his own children with the responsibility of his wives and girlfriends, and had no need to bother with general domestic duties, such as ironing. And here, in fact, is the crux of the matter. Carl's head invites consideration of who gets to enjoy a description artist and what conditions enable their creativity. While well, Picasso had followed exactly the same process in making his work as Sigurum had done when making her own, only Picasso had, has been described as a genius and brilliant visionary. Social distinctions between male and female forms of labour are also the topic of critical engagement in The Builder's Wife, a work that combines a plastering trowel and an ironing board. Cedrum indicated to me how it came about. And when I first in moved into this studio, actually, in the backyard I found a builder's uh, trough, which looks a lot like an iron. It's got a handle, it's wooden, of course, and it's got a flat part. And from the time I found it, in my head I saw an iron. Uh, and so I kept it and I think I had it for like two or three years 
before I actually made this work. And when I saw that specific ironing board, I was like, that's a match. <laughs> this builder's trough has been waiting for this <laughs> ironing board to make this piece. So I simply attached a cord to, the, to this builder's trough suggesting that it's an iron and then of course placing it on the ironing board makes that suggestion even more obvious. A wonderfully ironic work in its transmuting of an object associated with the usually masculine activity of plastering into the usually feminine activity of ironing. It prompts the viewer to reflect on the gendering of labour and professions. The work might be considered a counterpart to Carr's head in the sense that rather than being an iron that has become something else, it is something else that's a plastering tool that has become an iron. The builder's wife is also parodic, referring generically to the ready-mades that Duchamp produced. It would seem also to refer to strategies of using found items on the part of the avant-garde more generally. It's noteworthy that a found iron of the type that was heated on a stove was famously transformed into an artwork by Man Ray, entitled The Gift. But Seagram's works are at odds with the machismo that sometimes underpins works of this type. The only modifications that Man Ray made to the iron, which he purchased from a hardware store, was to attach a row of sharpened nails to its base. The work's subsequent sadistic Potential was acknowledged by the artist in a comment in which he also revealed an othering and an objectification along gendered and racial lines, which is such a disturbing current within Western modernism. And I quote, You can tear a dress to ribbons with it. I did it once and asked a beautiful 18-year-old coloured girl to wear it as she danced. Her body showed through as she moved around. It was like a bronze in movement was really beautiful, unquote. Seagram's iron does not link two items that counter each other. In other words, an iron that smooths and nails that tear. Rather, it reveals an analogy between the shape of an object used to smooth cloth and one used to smooth plaster. Most crucially, it differs from Man Ray's work in that it highlights and offers a critique of gendered assumptions rather than operating within those biases. As with many other feminist artworks, Venus at home alludes to the domestic milieu being a potential site for oppression and conflict. One instance where this is invoked is three sisters-in-law, where the sticks of three conjoined brooms are surrounded by some bangles the artist had been gun collecting prior to the Venus at home initiative and which she thought would be evocative in this context. She points out that a Hindu woman receives a set of red glass bangles when she marries, and these items are considered symbolic of the marriage, but rather than being allowed to wear them, the idea is that the recipient will break them when she's widowed. In Three Sisters-in-Law, the bangles do not simply link the three women whom each of the brooms are implied to represent, but also constrain them. The artist explains the context she had in mind. And in a traditional Indian, uh, of Indian descent family, uh, I mean, I, I don't look like that, but in many, like my mother's generation, the sister-in-laws and their husbands, the brothers and their wives all live together, usually with Mama Zala, the mother-in-law as well, uh, or if the father-in-law is alive. And there's always family politics. I mean, you can imagine. Um, and so, and from my experience of like my aunts and my, my mom and their kind of uh, cousins and friends, uh, is that this relationship is often very, very constrictive, uh, very uh, the opposite of free, the mm. opposite of independent. And so I had all these bangles and I put, I simply slotted them into three brooms together. And for me, it was such a clear and powerful symbol of this uh, relationship where you, you can't move. Uh, so you bonded by marriage, but not by blood. These are not, they're not sisters, they're sister-in-laws. 
but sister, like the word sister in there, that you're meant to have the sisterly relationship, but it's far from that. The very shiny bangles with their glossy and colourful exterior mask what is in fact often a fraught and conflicted relationship. In one work in the show, the actual history of abuse formed the backstory to one of its components. In affairs of the home, Seedrum has included two discarded signs from the Department of Home Affairs that she had purchased at a scrapyard, welding them to a steel lining board. It's an ironic conjunction, one that perhaps talks about attempting to iron out enormous difficulties when establishing a home in a new country. Arranged with the two boards propped against one another so that their outer edges are triangles, the structure also repeats a shape that features elsewhere in Venus at Home, and that Cedrum used deliberately to symbolise female empowerment. When the artist originally attached the signs to the ironing board, she felt the work was still missing something, and that she needed to, as she puts it, warm it up. Her thought was to add a blanket, not a new one, but rather one that carried visual traces and aromas of use. Given the references to immigrants and the difficulties they might encounter that was implicit in the Department of Home Affairs signs, she sought a participant at the Methodist Church in Plain Street, next to the Johannesburg Court, which had often served as a place of sanctuary for refugees. Her idea was to arrive with a new blanket and find somebody taking shelter at the church who would like to exchange it for an old one and who was willing to have their blanket included in an artwork. But whereas she'd previously gone to the church when it was full of people, she found only one person there, a woman in a wheelchair. While Seedrum could not follow her account clearly, she ascertained that the woman was not an immigrant, but rather a refugee from a terrible domestic situation in her home in the Limpopo province. The woman was very happy to exchange her own worn blanket for a new one, and Cedrum used the donated blanket to cover the legs and base of the ironing board, making its aroma a part of the work. So the blanket itself um, had a, quite a strong smell, and I purposefully didn't uh, wash it. Uh, and it was quite an intimate uh, way of working, because it's close up. I, was, I stitched the the blanket onto the legs, and the stitching is also like what our stitches, they're healing, right? It's about joining. But I, it was quite difficult for me to work with this, and it's probably the energy of the, of the material, it's knowing her story, it's having met her, uh, and, and also that relationship with home affairs, uh, yeah, it was not easy to work with. Thus here, as in hairstyles, the focus is on what Douglas termed marginal matter, and Chris David termed objection matter traversing the margins of the body, the sweat and urine that had infused the blanket unsettles the viewer because it defies boundaries. Along with alluding to matter out of place, the work may be interpreted as suggesting actual physical injury and bodily trauma through a small detail on the blanket. Cedrum found on the item, as she puts it, a little tag that said it was from the Red Cross, unquote. This emphasis on the defying of borders of the body assumes ironic form in a work that features a sign from the Department of Home Affairs that is a government department intended to prevent a defiance of regulations surrounding borders, but in this instance, geographic ones. Venus at Home was a landmark in the artist's own practice. The show marked the beginning of a more concertedly feminist direction in her work, as well as suggesting how concepts of the domestic might be explored compellingly through the deployment of ordinary household items. One of a number of areas in which this has happened is with the using of irons to represent wings. I started making wings out of these irons because they, again, they're such a contradiction. The iron the iron, it's just the basis of the iron, it's not the full iron, but they're quite heavy, they're metallic. They, the last thing they are is light and feathery. Um, but I was looking at the position of a woman in the domestic place as one that lacks freedom. 
uh, that is uh, oppressed, that is controlled, and I wanted to give her some wings. <laughs> so I started making wings as kind of aspirational, hopeful. The irony, the irony, of course, is that they will never fly. Mm -hmm. But the idea of something that can take off. Uh, and then when I got asked to um, propose a work for the Radisson, I was in the midst of making smaller wings, like this size smaller wings. And I thought, how wonderful to make an enormous set of wings and make it, but not participatory, but interactive, where a person can stand and kind of have this Instagrammable moment. And so that's what I did, and it's been a huge success. But besides providing direction for Seedrum's own practice, Venus at Home is significant as a landmark feminist exhibition, engaging with the complexities surrounding the domestic milieu and home in a South African context. It simultaneously questioned gendered notions of creativity and masculinist privilege, produced in a spirit that tallies with what Paula Scher defined as serious play, its engagement with domestic labour and the politics of the home was fresh, new, experimental and rebellious. <laughs>